you, you should see at the top of your screen is Director of Counterpoints, which is a research and advisory group in London that focuses on new forms of political and social risks. She's also the author of this excellent book, which I totally recommend, Populocracy. And she is a, a former and a recent Parisienne, and she's trilingual English, French, Italian native, which is very unusual. Catherine, can I start by asking you, before we get on to the Le Pen's, how did you get to be trilingual? I think this is really appropriate in two ways as a question. First, because I got to be trilingual because my father was a diplomat and he was a French diplomat. Um, and, um, and so he would be so pleased to know that I'm speaking to so many members of the Alliance Francaise. I feel a little bit as though I'm here as a representative of the Alliance Francaise Chicago, which is where I got my American accent. Um, so this is great. And then secondly, it's appropriate because I'm a cosmopolitan. I am the Le Pen's living nightmare. Um, and, you know, and I relish that. <laughs> but when I said you're an expert on Le Pen, you're both an expert as an academic, but you're also a personal expert because you've had this very unusual sort of, I could say intimacy with the Le Pen family. Tell us how you first met the Le Pens. Sure, so I, um, I started writing a PhD um, on the far right in Europe. And then I decided that what I was uh, really wanting to concentrate on was the, the far right in, in France. Um, and I was doing that PhD um, at McGill University in, in comparative politics. And I really felt as though um, if there was one you know, uh, political tradition, an ideological tradition that would really benefit from, you know, deep conversation and a kind of a real, um, a real intimate, almost physical knowledge of the kinds of people that we're talking about, it is the far right, because, you know, it is so much about leadership, it is so much about the kind of connections that a leader like Jean-Marie Le Pen can forge with his, uh, with his audience and, and with his voters, that it seemed to me absolutely crucial um, that, I, that I meet him. Um, so I, I started as a sort of, uh, you know, 20 year old PhD student to worm my way in first into um, the FN as, as a party and their communications officers and so on and so forth. And then finally, um, I landed their, uh, their press secretary who was, um, aside from the fact that she was working for the FN, she, she was also uh, a relatively nice person. And she said, I think I can get, I think I can get you a meeting with him. Although it's a lot easier if you meet up with him in Brussels rather than try and meet up with him um, in Paris. And of course he was an MEP uh, for, for the FN. So the first time I met Jean-Marie Le Pen um, was in Brussels um, and I, I found myself um, in his office, uh, you know, on a kind of July afternoon. And it was, it was the part of the, um, it was part of the European parliament where all the people who were sort of persona non grata hung out, you know, all the, all the different far right uh, representatives of, of different European countries. So there was sort of kind of tumbleweed in the corridors. And at the end of this really clinical corridor, there was this giant office with, with this giant man sitting in it, you know, this really um, uh, physically imposing, very energetic man, um, Jean-Marie Le Pen, with whom I would develop a, a kind of a you know, not a close relationship, but a, a more cordial relationship than, than I thought I ever would, because we spent quite a lot of time together. And so this is in the 80s. Let's go back to the beginning. Jean-Marie Le Pen is kind of the bridge between the Vichyist far right of wartime France, of people who had sympathized with the Nazis or worked with the Nazis. And then it goes through the, the far right goes through its Algerian phase where they want to keep Algeria French. And Jean-Marie Le Pen takes that movement all the way to the present day. So can you tell us where he comes from and how he bridges these different eras of sort of French far right policy? Sure, sure. So it, it's, and it's, it is really interesting because um, I think that that's what's so compelling. I mean, you know, not that I have any kind of sympathy for his politics, but it is, you know, quite compelling politically and intellectually um, because he, he, in a sense, traverses, uh, you know, these really foundational transformative moments 
um, of, of, the, of the far right and actually takes the, the party probably away from the far right and towards something that is um, less extreme but no less dangerous in a sense, which is, which is populist uh, politics. I think one thing that's important, you know, just as, as background is that, um, so Jean-Marie Le Pen, you know, is, you know, he's the heir, uh, of course, of, you know, the far right in, during the war, but he's also the heir of something that comes, you know, from, you know, further back, which is a kind of counter-revolutionary tradition in France, which feeds the far right, right? The, you know, these people hate the Republic, right? They mourn the monarchy. Um, so between 1789 and all the way to the, in, into the uh, Second World War, you've got this intellectual French tradition, you know, which grants the French far right a lot of its power because it actually does have thinkers, it does have writers, right? It's not a kind of barren landscape, you know, not, not at all. It's got very compelling intellectual figures that sort of refute the, the revolutionary heritage. So there's a bit of that in Jean-Marie Le Pen. Then there's, you say, there's, you know, some of the, um, you know, some of the much more, uh, the, the idea is much more connected to to fascism uh, and to, you know, and to versions of, of Nazism, that weird hybrid that did take hold in France, but didn't quite flourish in the way that it did in, in Italy and in Germany, but, you know, had it had its own presence and, and, and huge significance. And then, as you say, um, you know, there is Jean-Marie Le Pen's, you know, uh, engagement into the defense of French Algeria. And here what we see is this movement that is really about the, different, the defense of France as a colonial power, right? And the rebellion against Gaullism. So, you know, you've got these three moments and I would probably add to that, you know, a moment between the war and Algeria, which is the moment of Poujade. This is the first time that um, Jean-Marie Le Pen actually enters the French assembly as the French Assembly's youngest member, actually. Um, Poujade is a legendary French figure, by the way, who um, his name still resounds in French politics as a kind of shopkeeper, far racist. Yeah, he was a sort of 1956 version, uh, a French version of Nigel Farage in some ways, sort of, you know, the, the kind of the, the seeds of populism. And, and, and Jean-Marie Le Pen is also associated with that. And that's kind of a, an early pushback, really, against modernization and what would eventually turn out to be globalization. So what's interesting about Le Pen is that he tries to fuse all of these things into, into one party in 1972. So he's born in Brittany, I think around 1930. Yeah. And he's an adolescent in World War II. His father is sort of killed by the Germans. And, yeah. and then he goes to Algeria while it's still French, while the French are trying to fight to keep Algeria French and he becomes a torturer. And in fact, that's the first time you meet Marine Le Pen where the issue of him being a torturer in the Algerian war comes up. Can you tell us that moment when you met her? Sure. Um, so interesting uh, moment when um, I saw Jean-Marie Le Pen, sometimes at, in Brussels, sometimes at his office in Paris, and sometimes at his real office in Paris, which was at his house. Um, and I, I, went, um, I went once to have an umpteenth conversation uh, with him. Um, and while we were upstairs in, in his study, um, his daughter Marine uh, barged in. This would be about, I would say, 20 years ago. Um, and, um, and she barged in and she, you know, and she said, uh, you know, dad, dad, you know, you've, you've got to come downstairs. I finally found the tape um, of that guy who says that you're the one who tortured, tortured him in Algeria. Um, and so, uh, you know, he said, oh, fine, you know, well, you know, something like, you know, show me this bozo who he is and so on. And so, you know, we, we go downstairs and, I, and I, I found myself sort of, you know, watching this testimonial tape um, of this, you know, elderly Algerian showing, you know, rolling up his trouser uh, leg and, you know, and showing this really deep, um, ugly scar and, you know, and saying, you know, of course it was Jean-Marie Le Pen, of course I remember who it was. I'll never forget the face of the man who did this to me. Um, and, and at that point, you know, there was a moment of frank unease because I, I was struggling with what I was seeing and um, Jean-Marie and Marine just basically had a laugh. 
and um, and Marine Le Pen and, and Jean Marie Le Pen said, you know, well, I should have done a lot worse to him. Um, you know, at this point, you know, it wasn't such a it wasn't so easy to go in and, and have lunch with him, um, you know, following following that. But it was a it was an incredibly revealing moment, partly because um, you know the 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 kind of com complicity between father and daughter, you know, despite the fact that this was you know this was a, a a historical event to which you know she wasn't personally connected in a sense. The complicity was so strong, um, and and also because. Um, you know, you could see that they, that they were historically connected through these through these moments, and that he he did kind of um, he he sort of kept the flames alive, right, of these historical moments within within his family, um, and I think that that's what makes her, you know, b both have such an echo in France at, at the moment, but but probably places some limits on how far she can go. We'll come to Marine and whether she can become president in next year's elections. But I'm very intrigued by your interactions with Jean-Marie Le Pen. And uh, Camille Lando has a question about that. What pretext did you use to interview him? I mean, there you are, you're a young PhD student. You're not a far right person yourself, du tout. And you go and interview, you go and meet and apparently become quite chatty with this old man who's a one could say a fascist and an anti-Semite and a racist. How did that work? So, so a couple of things. First of all, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I've made quite clear just how much of a pest I made of myself um, in order to get, you know, to get the first interview. Um, and, you know, it took a good 18 months to, to finally make that work. And, you know, so I had a lot of chats with a lot of people connected to him, but, you know, never quite with the great man and, and, and all of that. And then I think, you know, because I asked myself the same question, you know, why, why would he bother talking to me? Well, so one thing that I think we underestimate is that we're bothered by you know, their ideology, but they're not at all bothered by ours, right? You know, he, he doesn't care, you know, he doesn't care, uh, who didn't care what I, what I thought, you know, or where I came from. The point is that for him, he knew that I was writing about him, that probably the book would get published, and that there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? I mean, at the time, one of the things that really struck me um, is that every time I spoke to him, every time I spoke to, um, to Marine and, and to his office, is that their, the, the relentless gripe was the fact that they were not being given equal airtime, they were not being given, you know, equal attention, that, you know, given how many people they represented, you know, the, the media and the press should be paying a lot more attention to them. So I think that I came along at a time, you know, when they were desperate uh, for attention and and that and I think that that really worked and and also I think I think that uh, I was genuinely interested in what he had to say even though he lied a lot of the time um, and and you know one of the things that really made me laugh and that I think um, I think I will stay with me forever is that you know one day we had a really interesting conversation about you know his vision about France and and of France. Um, and then finally he sort of shrugged and he said, you know, I don't understand. I don't understand how an intelligent young woman like you can be on the left. <laughs> and, you know, and so um, from that moment on, we had a truce. He sort of accepted that I was on the left, but that he could, you know, still have interesting conversations with me and that I was going to milk the conversations for everything they were worth. And you had some sort of bizarre public moments, like walking into a restaurant with him at a time when the French far right was beyond the pale, was you know seen as a menace to the Republic, as anti-democratic, as you know the inheritors of Vichy. So then you walk into a restaurant as a young woman with Jean-Marie Le Pen. How was that? So it was interesting because again, you know, it, it showed a lot. Um, you know, his his communication savvy, the fact that you know he knew how to position himself. Um, you know, this was uh, the, the, the instance you're referring to was a, a point in Brussels, and it was on my birthday. Um, and so he said, you know, something to me like, you know, uh, are you going back to, to Paris tonight or, or, or whatever? And I, and I said, oh, um, yeah, because it's my birthday. And he said, ah, well, if it's your birthday, then I have to buy you lunch. And I, I, I was just so, I mean, you know, I was a bit 
I don't know, I just lacked at the time, you know, I just lacked repartee and, and, and I said, oh, oh, sure. So, you know, he engineered this, um, this quite flashy restaurant that he knew would be full and would be full of MEPs and full of European bureaucrats. And then, you know, sort of walking in and knowing that, you know, that, that nobody would know who I was, um, you know, and I was young and attractive then. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, you know, sitting us both down at a table and, you know, making sure that he loudly popped a bottle of champagne and so on. So he was very, very good at using these moments, but these moments were also really useful to me in terms of, you know, really getting a sense of the fact that he wasn't just a political leader, that he, he really was, you know, an incredibly uh, savvy political operator and communicator. Yeah, I mean, that's particularly interesting, given that at the time, there were very few people like that on the political stage in the Western world. And now, of course, we know that type much better than we did 30 years ago. You mentioned, you know, the first conversation or one of the first conversations, he just lied and lied to you to test you. And of course, in America, we've seen, you know, the power of a politician who just stands there and does barefaced lies. So what, what did Jean-Marie Le Pen prefigure in terms of what we've seen since? So, so I think, you know, this was one of the, it, you know, it, it, it struck me at the time, but I think the, the value uh, or the significance of those lies really only, you know, came to the fore with me, you know, particularly, I have to say, you know, uh, under Trump, right? Um, you know, that's when, it, you know, the, that's when the, the use of the lie became quite clear. I mean, at the time, I was initially, I, I was, you know, dumbfounded by the fact that, um, he knew I was recording him, right? Um, and, and he kept giving me different versions of fundamental things, like, for example, you know, how his father died, you know, once his father, you know, depending on the story, his father was murdered by the Germans, on an, you know, in another story, he drowned and he was washed up on shore, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he just kind of never gave you the same version twice. And, and I remember at the time, you know, thinking um, over over a period of you know a year or so that certainly one of the things that he was doing, and which I think that political leaders like him, you know, populist uh, leaders um, do, is that basically you know they they're testing your your um, capacity to react, not to react in terms of um, you know keeping the story straight yourself but rather they want to see whether you're going to react to the fact that they're breaking a fundamental rule, right, of legitimate political discourse, right? The, the fundamental rule of legitimate political discourse, you know, for people, I would say, you know, people like us to, to you know, cut a long story short is that you try and, you know, you try and tell the truth. You, you try and not to dissimulate. If you do dissimulate, you certainly don't want to get caught. Um, and actually what he was showing me repeatedly, and which I think we've seen in spades since then, is the fact that, you know, a lot of that far right, but also mostly that populist stance is about showing that you don't, you don't care at all about the rules of the game, right, and of the rules of representative democracy, that in fact, you're, you're very, very happy to smash them, you're very happy to transgress, and the message that you're sending is, I really don't care, you know, if your your fundamental, um, you know, political values as a Democrat, you know, are irked by this. Um, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. Um, and and I think that you know we've seen this challenge, you know, in spades now. You know, certainly, you know, the the four years of Trump, you know, telling blatant lies, not because he didn't know he was lying, but because actually the lying was such a powerful signal of power that he could say whatever he wanted and that he could upset people and he didn't care. And actually his supporters liked him for it. You know, the chutzpah of actually lying and breaking every rule like that actually made them feel good about him and feel good about themselves. Because they don't like our rules. But another very Trumpy aspect of Jean-Marie Le Pen and the family in hindsight is that he had this quite bizarre and spectacular. It was a fine family dynasty like the Trumps. And there were very weird public events. And my favorite, which I had 
is, is the most bizarre political story I think I've ever heard in France, is when his ex-wife leaves taking his glass eye with her. And the denouement of that is even weirder. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, so so um, he and his he he and his ex-wife did you know did not uh, leave on particularly good terms uh, did not part on particularly good terms um, and they were on such bad terms that you know she took one of his most prized possessions which was um, his glass eye and and by the way you know uh, in parentheses he has about 10 different stories about how he came to have a glass eye, right? Once it's a bar brawl, once he's defending a friend, once it's an infection. I mean, you never get, you never get the same story, but he does have a glass eye. Um, and initially, actually, I don't know if people here remember early pictures of Jean-Marie Le Pen. He used to go around with an eye patch, um, which, you know, gave him a sort of you know, uh, a, a vaguely sort of Che Guevara type of look. I don't know, it was very, it was a very strange look. Anyway, she left and um, she took his glass eye with him. And then as part of the divorce settlement, um, you know, in a, in, in a basically uh, an exchange because she, she was starting to give, um, you know, extremely uh, indiscreet interviews. She was posing naked uh, for uh, sort of for girly magazines, um, you know, and she was giving incredibly indiscreet interviews, um, you know, and at, at one point um, they agreed in exchange you know, in in some forest somewhere that somebody, you know, was going to come and I can't remember what the exchange was with. Maybe you remember, Simon. Yes, and it's very bizarre. She had left the Le Pen mansion because we should all say he lives in a massive chateau just outside Paris, which was given to him by an admirer. She had left the mansion with the glass eye, but she had forgotten her mother's ashes. That's so it. She left it behind the mother's ashes in the chateau. She was keen to get them back for sentimental reasons. So representatives of each side meet in the forest, as you say in your book, in a Le Carre-esque scene, and yeah. the glass eye is exchanged for the mother's ashes. So if you ever leave your partner taking his or her glass eye, do not forget your mother's ashes. <laughs> there is a lesson in there for us all. <laughs> so they have this very um, spectacular life, and he also goes out of his way to offend particularly about what is the kind of most sensitive subject in France, certainly at the time, the Holocaust. So how does he use the Holocaust in a way to build himself up? So I think particularly, um, so particularly to begin with, um, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, you know, was trying to, he, was, he tried to form this party in 72 with a, a, a kind of, it was a kind of motley crew where, you know, you had sort of, you know, very traditional Catholics, you had former Nazis, you had former, um, uh, Al, you know, um, former Algeria supporters, and you had a lot of anti-Semites and, you know, the odd weird, you know, monarchist and counter-revolutionary. But you know the tradition that um, he felt he could access most readily um, in France was this tradition of revisionism, um, a tradition of you know uh, anti-Semitism that was kept alive by you know a number of a number of writers that is still you know kept alive today by a number of of, of commentators. So he went out of his way. To, to connect with, uh, with revisionists and to, um, to sort of tell an alternative history of France, um, you know, bizarrely, you know, France not as collaborator, but nevertheless, you know, a France that privileges its uh, traditional Christian Catholic uh, tradition. Um, and so one of the, you know, one of the points that he really, um, that, how can I put it, that he, 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 had, uh, he had recourse to was basically, uh, uh, basically calling into question the existence of the gas chambers. Um, and this is something that, you know, went down as one of his most famous pronouncements uh, when on television, somebody asked him, you know, do you actually deny you know, the Holocaust. And he said something like, you know, I don't, I don't deny the Holocaust, but people talk about gas chambers. Uh, and I'm not saying they didn't exist, but he says something like, I have never seen any evidence uh, of them. 
Um, and it's a, it's, the, it's a detail of history as well as a great beautiful. It's a detail of history, and we cannot, you know, reduce. Um, we cannot reduce French uh, history uh, to collaboration um, and get overly, in a sense, you know, overly bogged down as he would see it by these so-called details. Um, and he he paid a very high price for it. I think what's worth saying here is that a number of people who were, um, you know, in the television station and were in his team um, at the time say that when he left uh, the interview, he, his first reaction, you know, the first things he said to his team was, I think I kind of screwed up. Um, and, but I think that, you know, that, that was something which at the time, certainly in the 1980s and early 1990s, that was very much a kind of Le Pen point of discussion where, you know, people kept wondering whether he was doing it on purpose just to get a rise out of people or whether he was just gaff prone. Right? Um, were these calculated gaffes or not calculated gaffes? And he based, you know, this was the a lot of the discussion around Le Pen was around that. You know, is he fully in control of what he's saying, uh, and he's doing it on purpose to needle people, or does he sometimes just go off on one, and he's actually a very unreliable communicator? And the same questions, of course, with Trump, and maybe it's both. Yeah. So he starts as a as an anti semite. And then gradually, as the uh, Muslim population in France, which has always been there, becomes more prominent, becomes a political issue, he surfs the wave of Islamophobia. I'm going to use that word, um, knowing it's controversial, I believe it's an absolutely correct word. And he surfs that to reach the second round of the French presidential election in 2002. We should say French presidential elections, including next year, two rounds. First round, everyone participates. Second round, it's just the top two. And so the Le Pen aim has always been to reach the final two. He succeeded in that in 2002. But in the final round, he's wiped out by Jacques Chirac. Everybody comes out to vote against him. He gets less than 20% of the votes, I think. So then he hangs on as leader for a few years. In about 2011, I believe, he gives way to his daughter. So how does that handover go? Is it entirely amicable? No, I mean, the, the handover isn't an entirely amicable. Um, first of all, I think that, you know, what's important is that by 2011, um, Le Pen is seen as a liability uh, because between, uh, you know, between 2002 and 2011, the, the party undergoes a major split uh, with people who want to follow Le Pen on the one hand and follow his rival on the other, uh, Maigret. Um, and that split, in a sense, you know, casts a real doubt as to whether or not the party can continue to exist as it has since 1972. So there's a, you know, that split introduces a fundamental fragility and it introduces the, the possibility, which had never really occurred to anybody, um, that Le Pen wouldn't, you know, lead the, the Front National and, and almost until he died. Um, but so, so that's one thing. And, and we know that, you know, successions in these parties are very, very tricky things because the party is so linked to one, you know, specific figure. I mean, it is such personalized leadership that, you know, that the idea that no matter how much you say that you have a political bureau and a political organization, actually the, the fact is that everybody knows that, you know, the, the, the guy, the main guy calls the shots. So, even though he, he had brought in Marine Le Pen, he had brought in Marine really to take care, you know, to appeal to younger voters, but also to take care of the youth, the kind of the youth wing uh, of the party to, to give it a bit of a makeover. But he hadn't particularly planned, you know, on ceding power to anybody, first of all. Um, and he certainly hadn't particularly planned on ceding power to her. Even but, though he was about AC at the time. Yes, but he, but, but two things. First of all, I mean, having, you know, having, uh, you know, seen him in, and, and met with him at the time, he was a pretty, still a pretty formidable 80 year old. Um, that, you know, that's for sure. But also, you know, in, in his, his, this was, the party was his thing, right? Um, so, and anybody who tried to change it was immediately branded uh, a traitor. However, you know, the con, you know, he was, he was sidelined. Um, he was sidelined in part because 
instances in the party, including his daughter, realized that you know the 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 tried recipe of anti-Semitism plus you know being you know anti the Republic was basically you know starting to to lose. They simply you know these these voters were disappearing, um, and they needed to appeal to to younger voters. And when it came down to it, Marine Le Pen went uh, went against um, what the person who had been uh, Le Pen's number two, Bruno Gollnisch. Um, and at that point, handing over to Bruno Gollnisch, even though there was something of, uh, there was something natural about it because he had been in the party, you know, for, for a much longer time, it would have been probably uh, handing over to somebody who um, was a bit more moderate, a bit more open, whereas handing over to his daughter and, and you know, making sure that the contest would come out in her favor was actually something that he could probably live with more. I mean, as I've said before, she was, you know, I think she's closer to his thinking, regardless of how she communicates it, than somebody like Bruno Gollnisch, the other rival, would have would have been. Yeah, I mean, how so Jean-Marie Le Pen is quite unashamed. He's a racist. He he's out and proud. Marine has tried this strategy of what the French call de-diabolisation, de-devilizing, you know so they no longer look like the devil. Is she really more moderate than her father or is this fake? Um, I, think, um, I think that she is, you know, slightly more moderate on, on, on certain issues, but not on the central issues. So, you know, does she really, you know, how much of an opinion does she really have on, on gay marriage? Not a lot. How much of an opinion does she have on abortion? You know, not much of an opinion. Um, you know, she's probably more socially liberal than her father was simply, you know, by virtue of, of her gender and her generation. Um, but I think, you know, on issues to do in particular um, with race, and, and I think in particular, specifically, as you say, with Islam, um, I think, you know, she is just as anti um, or as phobic, as one might say, um, as, as her father was. Um, I just think that, you know, she has been, you know, strategically smarter than him. And she has been able to do something which I think um, probably Jean-Marie Le Pen could have done, but it wasn't quite as available to him. His, his base was very much a petty bourgeois base that was you know, in the south of France that was anti-immigrant and, and, and racist and anti-immigrant and very much the product of the post-Algeria years. What Marine Le Pen did, um, which was a stroke of genius, was um, open up to a completely different set of voters who were much more working class voters and, you know, who, who felt that um, their jobs, but most of all, that their way of life um, was in danger. Um, and, you know, and those voters much more in, in you know, deindustrialized, um, you know, northern, northern France. Um, and, you know, in order to do, in order to appeal to them, she had to change her strategy, and, or, or rather change her discourse to match that, match that strategy. Um, she's, she's racist, but it's, you know, she goes in, uh, unlike her father, who would have gone against Islam directly, she is very careful not to do that. She goes into the defense of Western values, right? Which is a much more subtle way of being anti-Islam. But the Le Pen still have, I think, this basic belief of the French far right is that there are two classes of citizens. There's the Francais de Souche, people whose origins go back forever, people with names like Dupont. And then there are the people who, with names like Weinstein or Ibrahim, who in their view are not really French. So that except that Marine Le Pen, many of her voters are Southern European immigrants, uh, Italians, Portuguese, Spanish immigrants, whom there are many in France. And these people have kind of been accepted into the French body, the national body in the same way that Irish Americans and Italian Americans have been accepted as white. Is, are those analogies fair? Yes, I think so. I mean, and it's interesting because, um, you know, Southern Europeans in particular um, really uh, play a very specific role. They are, you know, the cautionary uh, but ultimately successful tale of good integration, 
right? You know, people who worked hard, you know, who didn't try and, you know, hang on to, to different values, who did everything they could to integrate. And, and more than that, right? You know, she would say to assimilate in a sense, right? And become, you know, indistinguishable um, from the Francais de Souche that, that you were talking about. So the more you tell this story of acceptance of these white Catholic, but Italian slash Portuguese slash Spanish immigrants, the easier it is to then point to, um, you know, to those more recently arrived immigrants or, you know, and particularly Muslim, um, Muslim French citizens who, you know, can be pointed to as wanting, as not really giving their allegiance to the country and wanting to uh, keep separate uh, and, you know, to preserve their own, uh, their own norms and their own cultures. Of course, you know, this is a, this is a complete whitewashing you know, of how, of the difficulties of Italians and Spaniards when, you know, when they arrived, when they arrived in, in, in France. Yeah, and you know, there were massacres of Italians in, in France in the 19th century. Exactly. I mean, you know, the received, you know, the, the, the received wisdom now is, ah, but, you know, of course they had no trouble integrating because they were Catholic, but they had huge trouble being accepted, you know, and at the time, you know, the accusation was that they were weirdly too Catholic, right? You know, that they had all sorts of, you know, deviant kind of versions of, of Catholicism. So this idea that somehow it was easy for them because they were fundamentally the same, whereas, you know, Muslims are fundamentally different. I mean, that's very much a concoction uh, of now. It was very difficult for them as well. And I think I'm right in saying that your father was an Italian immigrant to France. My, my father had dual, uh, yeah, my father had dual citizenship. He was, you know, half Italian and half French. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know whereof you speak. <laughs> There's a question from Amanda Kelly. How connected is Marine Le Pen to the other far-right leaders in Europe, um, to Abascal, the Vox leader in Spain, to Salvini in Italy? Because they're trying to create a kind of far-right international. Yeah, so um, specifically on Vox, to be honest, I don't know how connected she is uh, to Vox. What's, what's really interesting is, is two things. One is that over time, um, you know, Marine Le Pen is part of the Rassemblement National or Front National, as it was then known. And, you know, in a sense, she's almost, she behaves almost like, you know, far right and populist royalty, um, you know, in these European circles, right? You know, they have the, the pedigree of a, of a party that goes back to 1972, early electoral victories in the early 1980s and so on and so forth. And so in many respects, you know, she treats some people as a little bit, you know, infradig, a little bit unworthy, you know, upstarts. Um, but I think most importantly, the, the fact is that this, this sort of populist or far, you know, and far right international, I mean, this has been something that they've been trying to create, certainly at the heart of Europe, at the heart of the European Parliament, um, you know, for decades now. But the, the thing about nationalists is that they're just not very good at international cooperation, right? So, you know, whenever, whenever they try, um, generally they don't do very well. I mean, right now, Marine Le Pen and Salvini are in the same uh, group in the European Parliament. But what's interesting is Salvini, now it's his turn to do everything that he can to actually emancipate himself, you know, and try and integrate a more mainstream group um, you know, in, in order to kind of shed his, his, his radical image. So interestingly enough, we now have a kind of race between these parties in appearing to be as mainstream as they possibly can, you know, and leaving the, the kind of the Vox and the AfD in Germany behind, um, you know, as, uh, you know, radicals you don't want to hang out with, right? So it's interesting how these cycles move. There's a question from Helen Bloom, uh, co-signed by BC, related to that. What are the connections between her and Steve Bannon and Putin? Bannon would like to be the American brain of this far-right international. Maybe Putin is the Russian brain of it. How do they fit in? So, I mean, Marine Le Pen's always gone out of her way to say that, you know, she thought Putin was a great, uh, was a great uh, leader. Uh, and they lent, they lent her party a lot of money. And they lent her party a lot of money, exactly. So there's a, you know, there's a connection there. I mean, keeping in mind that um, she doesn't have much to lose uh, on this and that, you know, for Putin, basically, I mean, he'll fund anyone who's willing, you know, to sow a bit of trouble, right? Uh, so I think that that it stands to reason that that he'll fund 
he'll, you know, they'll fund her and Russian banks ostensibly will fund her, but basically on the order of Putin will fund anyone that is basically going to create mayhem and discord and fragmentation and, and, and volatility. The interesting thing about Bannon is that, you know, when, when he first came to Europe, um, everybody, uh, it was a big story, right? You know, that he was going to come and, you know, teach Europe a thing or two and the Europeans a thing or two about, you know, how to do well um, as, um, as populists. But what was interesting is that Bannon really was invited mainly by Orban, right? Mainly by the Hungarian leader. He, it's Orban that he had a direct relationship to. It's Orban um, who, you know, who found the money to, to pay him. And, you know, and people like Salvini and Marine Le Pen privately were sort of saying, you know, we don't, we don't need any lessons from Steve Bannon. What does he know? What does he know about Europe? But at the same time, you know, not wanting to completely alienate Orban. So, you know, a few photo ops, but it never really went, it really never went very far. Yeah, I got the impression Bannon overestimated himself. Just well, before we get on to Marine's chances, I should call her Marine Le Pen, not be familiar, in next year's election, people are very fascinated by your restaurant scene with Jean-Marie Le Pen, <laughs> which, as somebody said, could be, would be in the TV series. Did, was he a mob boss type of person? Did you feel personally threatened by him? What did he exude in those situations? Uh, no, and it's interesting, you know, because, you know, particularly given, um, you know, the the turn of the conversation, you know, uh, I was, you know, a young woman, you know, this this guy who, um, you know, tortured people in Algeria and is, you know, is in many ways, you know, such an, such an alpha male, right? Um, you know, I mean, there was never, I have to say, you know, never a hint of impropriety, you know, never, a, as the French say, a main baladeuse, you know, a, 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 a wandering, wandering hand, a wandering hand or anything, uh, or, or anything like that at all. So, but what he exuded, which I thought was really interesting was, um, you know, were, were two things. One was extraordinary energy, right? And this is something that I think, um, you know, anybody who's kind of been up close to, uh, you know, powerful politicians, you know, the, this kind of, this sense in which they, they very much feel they're unstoppable um, and they make you very much, and they make you feel very much that they are unstoppable, that there's this kind of reservoir of commitment, um, you know, that no obstacle will stand in their way, um, you know, and, and, you know, or early, you know, early to bed, uh, early to rise, late to bed, you know, huge concentration. So that that was the first thing, you know, that exuded. I mean, even the way that this man who, you know, at the time was already in his 70s, even the way that he walked, he walked like a young man, right? You know, he he entered a restaurant, you know, like a like a young man. Actually, if I have to say, given, you know, there's so many Americans in the audience, one of the people he really reminded me of was Jack Nicholson. Um, you know, a kind of, you know, you know, a, a sort of slightly overly, you know, overly stimulated, overly kind of physical, um, you know, uh, presence, um, uh, you know, quite cinematographic. Uh, yeah, also, ch also cheeky like Nicholson. Yeah, cheeky like Nicholson, you know, bit of a ham, you know, playing it up for the audience, you know, in the restaurant. Um, you know, that that kind of, you know, no disrespect to Jack Nicholson, right, you know, in comparing him to Jean-Marie Le Pen, but just, you know, in the kind of physical energy, um, you know, there was there was something of that. And then I think, you know, the, the other thing, uh, you know, very much, which uh, the hallmark of, of very, um, of very gifted politicians, um, making you feel like you're the only, you know, surveys the room, but nevertheless makes you feel like you're the only person in the room. Uh, but that's a that's a cliche, but no less true for that. Well, he's history now, let's say. He's 90 or so. Marie, Marine Le Pen is not history. In 2017, she reached the second round of the election. She reached the runoff against Emmanuel Macron, and she got, I think, 36% of the vote. So she lost in the runoff by a very large margin. Some polls are suggesting that in 2022, next year's election, she could she will also reach the second round, is the prediction. And she could do much better, some polls suggest. So, especially given that France, you know, is still in a very bad moment with COVID, there's going to be a massive economic crisis as we come out of this. 
how do you assess her chances? So, I mean, her chances in the second round, um, you know, I mean, I, I think I think that's almost sealed already. Uh, the recent polls give her and Macron, uh, you know, neck and neck at around 25 percent if in the, the first election round. in the first round if the election were held tomorrow, um, you know, and the next runner up is you know basically 10 points behind. So you know, at, 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 if the election were held tomorrow, there's absolutely no doubt that it would be a runoff between Macron and and Marine Le Pen. I think there is almost no doubt that she will be in the second round. I think, you know, if there's more fragmentation, if the vaccine rollout goes very badly, you know, maybe Macron isn't in the second round, maybe there's an accident, maybe there's an outsider, you know, that, you know, that that splits his vote or something like that. But to be honest, I mean, you know, and 14 months is a long time in politics, and particularly given the times we're living in. But to be honest, I do see a runoff between Macron and, and Marine Le Pen. What's interesting is that it's true that France is going through a very bad time. But if you remember 2017, you know, 2017, basically, France had gone through, you know, two things at least, right? But certainly two major things that should have granted, you know, Marine Le Pen as much oomph as she was ever going to get. You know, there had been the major migration crisis uh, in Europe in 2015 and 2016, and France had been the victim of, you know, horrific terrorist attacks in 2015. So 2017 was her moment. So to me, 2017, you know, was her moment. But the fact is that I think that there is a real glass ceiling that operates uh, for Marine Le Pen. I'm not saying that, um, you know, the, that the runoff won't be closer this time. At last time, in the second round, Macron got 66% and she got 34. Um, you know, if I, I did some number crunching um, this weekend, and the number crunching would tell me more 47 for Marine Le Pen and 53 for, for Macron, right? Um, Very close. So it's, it, it's, it's closer. I think that that's probably you know, my sense is it won't be that. I mean, those are the numbers right now. But, you know, when it comes down to it in the second round, Marine Le Pen is still beyond the pale for a lot of people for two reasons. One is she's her father's daughter. And for many people, you know, regardless of how they feel about Emmanuel Macron, there is no way that they will ever vote for a Le Pen. Um, you know, that's the far right. And there is simply no way they will cast a vote for somebody whose last name is Le Pen, and particularly somebody who's still, you know, essentially running her father's, uh, her father's party. So I think that, you know, there is, uh, no matter what, people will go holding their noses, even if they don't, you know, they won't like doing it, and so on and so forth. But I think that there is that glass ceiling. Um, and I, I also think that, you know, in many respects, at this point, Marine Le Pen is, she's in a sense, she has mainstreamed herself, but in a sense, she's got all the disadvantages of mainstreaming herself in that, you know, she's part of the political landscape, um, but she's got the, the Le Pen name and the Le Pen heritage. Um, and at the same time, therefore, she's lost this kind of outsider quality, right? She's lost the kind of, uh, you know, exotic, uh, different, protest type vote. So in a sense, she's more like every other politician, um, but not quite enough to swing it. Um, that's how I would see it. You sent us this slide, which we're showing on screen now. It will be a good um, French lesson for those of you in the Alliance Francaise. Au global, in general, the image of Marine Le Pen is in slight progression. Mm -hmm. But what you sent us this slide to point out that it's still not very good. So 79% um, see her as authoritarian. She's seen as arrogant. She is also seen as dynamic, as someone who veut vraiment changer les choses. She really wants to change things and is courageous. But people do not see her as sympathique, as nice, as rassurant, as reassuring. They don't think, uh, only 34% think she has the qualities needed to be president. So what you're saying this slide shows is that people don't see her as a president in waiting. That, that's exactly right. And um, I think that, you know, even though she even though she is the protest vote of more people than she used to be or than her father used to be, she still is a protest vote. Um, she's a vote uh, against the establishment, and that's quite effective. 
But when push comes to shove and people have to vote in the second round, um, you know, she's lacking some of the, uh, you know, she's lacking some of the fundamental qualities. It's very interesting that, you know, when you look at, you know, really wants to change things, you know, this is the, you know, this is the measure that really, um, you know, shows that, 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 that this is a protest vote, you know, it's a kind of, it's for people who just want to send a message that they would like things to change more fundamentally, but the rest of the slide essentially tells us that they don't actually, even though she wants to do that, and they admire her for wanting to change things, they don't actually think she has the qualities to do that. Lastly, let's come on to the next generation, the niece, Marion Marshall, who is you compared her when we talked earlier to Ivanka Trump. Who is Marion and how worried should we be about her? So, okay, so to, you know, full disclosure, I don't know how worried we should be about her because I mean, I'm in two minds uh, about her. She's, she is Marine Le Pen's niece. Um, she is uh, in, in some respects, a, quite an impressive character. She's based in the South of France. Uh, you know, she was uh, elected in the south of France, very, very young. I think first time she was elected, she must have been 22 or 23. Um, you know, she's a very, uh, very young, very blonde, uh, very dynamic, a bit Barbie looking, which is why I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, of, of Ivanka at the same time. And as I was saying um, to you both earlier, you know, beneath the Barbie doll exterior beats the heart of a true Nazi. You know, she's, you know, much more radical in some ways um, than her aunt. So more economically liberal, um, you know, but much more socially conservative and potentially, uh, you know, and potentially, you know, you know, much more racist um, and, and much more uh, Islamophobic. Now, she's in some ways, in some circles, she's been discussed for the past four, five, six years as the person to watch. The person who was, you know, she dropped her last name. Her, her full name is Marion Maréchal Le Pen. She dropped the Le Pen. She goes by Marion Maréchal, knowing full well that, you know, the Le Pen name does her a slight disservice. Um, you know, she's split from her aunt. Her and her and Marine Le Pen don't have a good relationship at all. She's positioned herself as much more able to work outside the traditional boundaries of a traditional political party. You know, she's founded this kind of institute for the social sciences. She works with civil society. She works with groups, with entrepreneurs. She comes across as much more modern and much more dynamic. And so in many respects, you know, you could argue that, you know, she is the next dynastic link. Um, but at the same time, I have to say, you know, I've been hearing this for a while and I'm not yet sure, uh, you know, how effective she really is and how credible uh, she, she, she really is to these traditional, uh, you know, to these voters. She's not going to appeal in her southernness and in, in her, in her kind of uh, very, um, uh, she, she's got a, a, a very sort of uppity, kind of uppity middle classness about her, you know, which is not going to appeal to those northern voters that her aunt Marine Le Pen has done so much to, to woo. So I'm not sure that she could have the, the broadest base, but she's somebody to watch. And particularly, she's going to be somebody to watch after 2022, because if Marine Le Pen actually either doesn't come close, you know, as close as people think uh, to the presidency, or if the party doesn't do well in the legislative elections, the parliamentary elections that take place a month later, then you know, heads are going to roll. Um, and I would imagine that you know the the, the discussion in the in the Rassemblement National will be about succession, and we'll have to watch what happens to Marion uh, 